Jesus. Thank you, God. Oh, you are not a God that is dead, Jesus. You are not a God that is just in our past, but Lord, you are alive and well, working within us, Jesus. And we worship and we praise you, Lord. And we exalt you, Lord, above all things, God. We give you the glory and the honor and the praise, my God. Hallelujah, it's an honor and it's a privilege to be in your house tonight. Lord, and we are so thankful. We are so thankful, my God. Hallelujah. Lord, lead us as we turn to your word. God, I pray, continue to be with us and have your way in this place here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You can be seated if you want. We're going to get into our Bible study tonight. I was looking for my husband. He disappeared. Thank you, Sister Heidi. Um, there are pens back there as well. I didn't bring those up. Um, but while your handouts are coming around, I'll just say it's good to have our brother from Spain here with us tonight. Thank you for joining us tonight. We're glad to see you. And of course, everyone else that is here. We had some trains canceled, so we're missing some because of that and others that are sick. But we're thankful that you are here. Amen. So we're continuing to talk about our Christ, about Christian disciplines. We cover prayer. We cover cover Bible study. And the one we're going to talk about tonight is not one that gets discussed quite as much. But it goes hand in hand with both prayer and Bible reading or study. Meditation. Now, if you've never heard teaching on this, don't shut me off right there, all right? We're going to take it to the Word of God, and we're going to show you what we mean from the Word of God. I feel like sometimes we're a little scared of talking about meditation because it's been taught, that word has been thrown around so much in our society. We think of, I can't say the word, my tongue won't get around it, but transcendental meditation, yoga, things like that. And so we kind of sometimes hear the word meditation and we don't, well, I don't want anything to do with that, which is right as Christians. But the thing is, everything that, the, that God has instituted the devil has a counterfeit for. But you don't stop spending money just because there's counterfeit money out there. You still use the real thing. And that how is how it is with the things of God. Just because the devil tries to imitate and twist something, it just means we need to go back to the word of God to get what God intended for it. So that's what we're going to look at tonight is meditation in the Bible. There are at least 23 direct mentions of meditation in the Bible. The first one we'll look at tonight is Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So we see here, first of all, let's just get the basics out of the way first. What is it that we are to meditate on? The word of God, the book of the law, or God's word. And if we do that, and we observe to do it, we obey it, then we will have good success. We all want to be successful. So this is a key that we need to practice in our lives. Another verse that talks about this, Psalms chapter 1. Verses 1 to 3. Blessed is the man. Some of you can quote this. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in what? The law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither. And whatever he does shall prosper. Doesn't matter the storms that come. It doesn't matter the rains that come, the seasons that come. A man who is planted by the rivers of water, who's meditating on the word of God, basing his life around it, will be fine and will prosper. So that's kind of our introduction. That's the groundwork. Okay, We see how meditation is mentioned in the scripture. And I have a lot to get through, so I'm sorry if I rush 
you'll see it's something I'm quite passionate about, and I'll explain why. The mind is our greatest battlefield. Proverbs tells us, for as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. All holiness in our lives, it starts on the inside. All sinfulness in our lives, it starts on the inside. And if you discipline your, because we're talking about disciplines, right? That's what we're talking about, Christian discipline. If you discipline your thought life, what goes on in here, in your mind, then the actions, I believe, will fall into place. If you will make up your mind that the way you think is going to be in line with the word of God, the obedience, the actions, they will follow as a natural consequence of that. This is something, talking about meditation and controlling our thought life, is something, like I said, I'm very passionate about. Some of you will know, some of you will not, uh, that I've str struggled with anxiety in the past, and God has brought me so, so far. Some of you have known me for a long time, but you didn't know me at my worst. <laughs> And there were so many different things I tried over the years, and it wasn't talked about when I was growing up. We didn't talk about mental health, where I was from. But I would try to pray, and it didn't seem like anything changed. I tried to just be better, you know, just fix it, stop doing that. I read, I attended seminars, and it's, it's been a journey. But really, what impacted me the most was understanding biblical principles about the mind and controlling our thoughts. I was in, and I'm going to share some of this with you uh, very briefly, very quickly, but I was in a Christian counseling class taught by Sister Clemens, a dear lady from the States, and she was talking about, you know, psychology, counseling, all of that, and she began to talk something that is, if you take any psychology classes, you'll probably learn about this, it's the ABC model of cognitive behavioral therapy. I promise this is going to get spiritual in a second, all right? But it's basically this. You have the activating event. So it's something like your car breaks down. It can be an external thing. Somebody says something. You're triggered, to use modern words, by something. Okay, it's the activating event, either external or internal. And at the end of it, you have the way that you react, the consequences. Now, it can go positive. You can choose to look at it in a positive light, or it can go negative and your reaction is very negative. You get angry. You go down a spiral of, uh, you know, just sad, whatever. But what leads between those two is your beliefs about the event. In other words, how you think, how you feel about it. That attitude in between. The car breaks down, you can go, I'm using this because we're having car problems, as you all know. But, you know, you, you have choice in how you think. And with anxiety, what I learned is it was all about the irrational thoughts. Because the survival part of the brain kicks in, and it, it doesn't matter that it's not logical. It goes worst case scenario, just down and down and down into that spiral. And I would get stuck into that spiral. And it became a vicious cycle. And this is so simple, but it's, it's true. Is I would just tell myself, well, don't think like that. I knew it was wrong. I knew that I didn't need to be scared about those things and go the way that I would go and it would go very self-destructive. But if I can tell you right now, don't think about the color blue, what happens? You think about the color blue. And so it wasn't, well, maybe some of you are stronger. You just had to be opposite. <laughs> but in reality, I was telling myself, well, just don't think those things. But I wasn't replacing the thoughts with anything. And that's what needed to happen, is I needed to systematically replace those thoughts with rational thoughts. Thoughts yeah. that were in line with reality and with the word of God. It's not maybe immediate, it's a process, because your brain, when you're used to thinking a certain way, it develops pathways, and you need to rewrite those pathways. But through the power of God, I believe that that is possible for do, to do. Now, what does any of that have to do with the Bible? Right? I'm throwing some psychology at you. I'm throwing personal testimony at you. What does that have to do with the Bible? Well, I believe that the Bible taught this principle long before modern psychology and cognitive behavioral therapy ever came along. Mm -hmm. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, 
and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Well, I want the peace of God. But the next verse says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praiseworthy things, meditate on these. That's our word, meditate on these. See, sometimes we read, be anxious for nothing, and we stop there, and then we beat ourselves up because, well, we're still worrying. It's not enough. You can't just stop there. You need the rest of the verse. You need the in everything, prayer and supplication and thanksgiving. To have the peace of God, we need to meditate on the right things. It is not enough. I'm sorry, I've neglected our blanks. Um, hopefully you've got some of them. But it is not enough to simply not think something. We must replace incorrect thoughts with correct thinking. So I've used my example talking about anxiety, but it's not just in, in that specific scenario. Psalms 4 and verse 4 says, Tremble and do not sin. Meditate in your heart upon your bed and be still. Now if you read in James chapter 1, verses 13 and 15, it explains the process of how sin occurs in our lives. It's you don't just wake up in the morning. Let me use an extreme example, okay? A man or a woman doesn't just make, wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to commit adultery today. It doesn't work like that. It's not a sudden thought that, that they just happens and they act on it. There's, there's a process between it popping into the mind and it being acted upon. James 1 says it like this. Let no one say, when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, when the desire is acted upon, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So it explains how sin is birthed in our lives. Temptation is not sin. Temptation is not sin. But it is very dangerous to linger in the place of temptation and allow those thoughts to continue and to dwell on them. We read about Joseph. Joseph was faced with temptation. Potiphar's wife was pretty much just, you know, offering herself up to him. And you re re read about what he did in the face of temptation. He got out of there as fast as he possibly could. He didn't hang around and, and flirt a little bit. No, he left his garment behind and got out of there with all that he could. And so we see here the danger of meditating on the wrong things. Because what you allow to, those desires, when you begin to those, allow those thoughts to become desires and you think about them, you might see something, a thought might pop in your head. You don't have control of every thought that pops into your head. I mean, maybe you do, but I don't. But you have control over what you allow to stay there. And when you allow sinful thoughts to stay there and you feed them, you will find yourself in very dangerous territory very soon. Why is this so important to understand? Because you cannot control what you see. We know, we look around in our world, all right? It is rife with immorality. It is rife with, you can go anywhere and you're gonna see something that you know is, is not in obedience to God. You're gonna see something. You can't control what you hear. We work in workplaces that are full of swearing, taking the name of the Lord in vain, our schools, you know, everything. There's music blaring every store you go to. You can't control what you hear. The world has so much access and input into our minds. And that's why I think it's important that when we have opportunity, we limit it. You might hear it out and about where you don't have to bring it into your home. 
Watch what you put in front of your eyes. Watch what media you choose to intake because you're already being bombarded with all of the, the, all of the influence of the world. You don't need to add to it. That's why it's so important we feed ourselves with good things. Bible, prayer reading. We're talking to Christian disciplines, right? But you can't control every single input, but you can direct the mind. You can control what you choose to dwell on. There's a proverb, not a biblical one, just, you know, a quote, that has a lot of truth. Watch your thoughts. Watch your thoughts. They become words. Perhaps you've heard this before. Watch your words. They become actions. Watch your actions. They become habits. Watch your habits. They become character. And watch your character, for it becomes your destiny. There's a lot of truth to that. And it starts with the thoughts. So we're talking about meditation. Mastering our thought life. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5. Let me read it and then we'll talk about it. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Okay, we're talking spiritual warfare. We're not talking, we, we know we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We're talking about warring in the spirit. But spiritual warfare does not begin with battling strongholds in our local area, strongholds in our nation. We know that there, the Bible talks about the Prince of Tyre. We know that there are demonic forces that like to grab a hold of areas and we need to pray and allow God to move in and cast them out of the way and we can do that. We have the authority in the name of Jesus. But those are not the primary strongholds that we face. The first stronghold, and I believe the strongest one, is within the mind. We read this here. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. That's where the battle starts. We need to make sure that we are, we're using our spiritual weapons right in our own lives and in our own minds before we try going using them in others. It's a difficult task for the mind is unruly, but we have a spiritual weapon. We can look at the armor of God. We've got the helmet of salvation. You can go through the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, etc. But we've got one that I want to talk about today, and that is the sword of the spirit. The word of God. Every single time that meditation is mentioned in the word of God, almost every time, the word of God is mentioned right alongside of it. That is what we are using. When thoughts enter the mind that are contrary to the knowledge of God, everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, we must tear them down and replace them with true knowledge with the word of God. Feelings can lie. Emotions can be deceptive. But we have knowledge in the word of God. Amen. Psalms 19 and 14 says, Let's the, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let the meditation of my heart be acceptable. And I think that that should be our prayer tonight. Now, you can see the sections on your handout. Next one, lessons from a cow. Taking a bit of a turn here, all right? Lessons from a cow. And let me just preface this before we get into it a little bit. We've already mentioned Eastern forms of meditation are not what we're talking about, that they are different. But I want to specify how they are different. A lot of those practices, they involve emptying the mind. And that's a dangerous thing. I can't help but think about the scripture, about the one that was delivered from the evil spirit. When the evil spirit came back, he found it empty and swept and ready for others to move in. And he, I'm paraphrasing, but he brought seven of his demon buddies along and moved on in. And 
there was, there's an old saying that says an idle mind is the devil's workshop. There may be some truth in that, but an empty mind certainly is. Those meditation practices leave you open, and I've heard stories and things that have happened, but they leave you open to demonic visitations and oppression. I'll just say categorically, Christians should not be involved in things like transcendental meditation, yoga, etc. Yoga was not originally designed for physical health. It was originally, I believe, Hindu origin, and it was all about becoming one with the divine, which is rooted in pantheism. Christians don't need to be involving themselves in that. I know that they're, and I've kind of been on the fence at times in the past, well, maybe the exercises are good, but let's not do the meditation part. I don't want to be around it, all right? I don't want to even dip my toe in the water if that's going to be a part of it. So watch and avoid those things. Even modern practices of mindfulness and affirmations or manifestations. You know, you repeat this mantra over and over again and then it'll be manifested in your life. There are proven benefits to your health by doing those things, but they just ad address symptoms and not the cause. Well, there may be a form of spirituality there, but I want to make sure that I'm getting my spirituality from the Word of God. Mm -hmm. yes. And the benefit of true Biblical meditation is so much greater Amen. than any small benefit that those things may have to offer. So what I want us to do now is define meditation from a Bible perspective. It is not about emptying the mind or attaining to our higher consciousness. That's not what we're talking about. There are three main words that are used in the Bible, two Hebrew words, one Greek. The first Hebrew word is Hagah which means to mutter or murmur. Mutter or murmur. Anybody talk to themselves on a regular basis? <laughs> you know, people think you're crazy. That's what this word means. It's to mutter. Perhaps they read the scriptures. Scriptures were always an out loud thing, by the way. They were read publicly, but even if read privately, it was always an oral thing. Muttering. Here, was You know, in muttering to yourself. Now you may, in some cases, do that inside your head. But it's, you understand what's going on there. The other word is siyak. Also refers to contemplation or reflection. But this same word, again, is used in different contexts for speaking, praying, even complaining. It's, again, we see the talking to yourself element. So I'm just going to give you permission. You're not crazy. Go ahead and talk to yourself. Just talk to yourselves about the things of the word of God. And we, it's biblical. So next time someone makes fun of you for talking to yourself, there you go. The Greek word that's used is meliteo, which means to revolve in the mind, to turn something over and over and over again, to think about it, look at it from different angles. So if I could use those words to define it, this is just my definition. It would be an internal conversation about the things of God. That's how I define meditation. Now in English, there's another word that means meditation or to meditate. And that's the word to ruminate. And this is where we come to the cow. A cow is what's known as a ruminant. It's an animal that chews the cud. So it's often said that cows have four stomachs. It's not really true. They have one stomach, but it's divided up into four compartments. The first one being the rumen, it's the largest. The food goes in there, the grass or whatever, and it begins the digestive process, and then it goes to the reticulum. Look, I've even given you a nice little diagram, so you know more about cow stomachs now than you probably wanted to know. The reticulum, it'll collect and, and take out foreign objects. And it's at this point, halfway through the digestive process, that the cow will regurgitate. Basically, I'm using layman's terms because I don't understand all of the fancy terms. But basically, regurgitate a ball of food out of the rumen stomach, back into their mouth, and they will chew on it some more. After a while, they will swallow that again, 
and it will go to the omason, which absorbs water and nutrients, and then the ab absomason, which again, it's the final step, stomach acids continue digestive. It goes on to the intestinal tract and all of those things. But because of this rumination or chewing the cud, this digestive process that they go through, they can digest things that we cannot, such as the cellulose fiber from plants. So they get every bit of nutrient that they can out of what they are eating by this process. And they spend most of the day, if you see a cow in the field, most likely it's either eating or it looks like it's eating because it's standing there lazily chewing away. There might not be a single blade of grass in sight and they'll still be chewing. Why? Because they brought up some, and I know it's gross, but they brought up some that they ate earlier. They will spend most of the day, six to eight hours, chewing their cud. And although, like I said, it might be a little gross, this is exactly what meditation is. It's taking the word of God that we've read, that we've studied, that we've hid in our heart, and it's bringing it back up to chew on it a little bit more so that we can get every bit of nutrient. We can get every bit of goodness that God has for us in it, that we can get that and receive it everything that God wants us to see. So, how do I meditate? Hopefully by now I've convinced you of the importance of biblical meditation, but how do you do that? Let me just say first, you already know how to do it. No one needs to teach you how to meditate. Let me just give you some life examples, all right? The girl whose classmates made a comment at school and she went home and she thought about it. Maybe it was about how she looked or you know, or how she acted. She went home and she began to think about it. She began to think, well, maybe, maybe they're right. She internalized it. The wife who fought with her husband in the morning, and he goes off to work, and she's at home, and she's still mad because she's, this is not a real story, by the way, and she's still thinking about it. I can't believe he said that. I can't believe he did that. The man who's worrying about finances or about providing for his family and keeps thinking on it. Try to figure out a solution. The saint who gets offended by somebody. The teen who's looking at the things of the world and thinking, I wish I could do that, I wish I could do that. Those are all examples of meditating on the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. So you know how to meditate. It comes quite naturally because you chew on those things and things get under your skin and you think about them and you obsess over them. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of what you chew on. Choose to chew on the word of God instead. If you know how to worry, and there's a blank there that says that. If you know how to worry, nobody needs to teach you how to do that. You know how to meditate. Amen. Just replace the things that you are thinking about with the word of God. If you know how to stay angry, you know how to meditate. If you know how to obsess over something, you know how to meditate. Just trade out what you're meditating on. So the practical application, and this is where we'll... We'll close off with this. There's five steps. These are not original to me, but maybe they will help you. Five steps to meditation based on scripture. The first verse that we'll look at here is Psalms 119 and 15. It says, ESV version, I will meditate on your precepts. Precepts is just another word for the, the law of God, the word of God. And fix my eyes on your ways. You want to meditate on the things of God? First step to that is simply focusing. Just making up your mind, I'm going to focus on the things of God now. It may involve setting some other thoughts aside and saying, no, I'm going to think about the things of God. I'm going to, I'm going to pull up this verse in my mind and I'm going, to, I'm going to chew on it. I'm going to chew on what God has spoken to me. Next one, Psalms 119 and 27, says, make me understand the way of your precepts. So I will meditate on your wonderful works. So we meditate to understand. You might read a verse in the morning. And how many know that when you read the word of God, it's not always a skim, skimming reading. Sometimes you have, to, you have to sit and you have to think and you have to let it sink in a little bit. Seeking to understand. What is this saying? What is this verse all about? What is God trying to say to me? Again, it's getting all of the nutrients out of it that we can. Psalms 
143 and 5, uh, take, going to the next one, it says, I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your works. I muse on the work of your hands. To remember. Remember the goodness of God. Remember what he's done for me already. Remember his salvation. Remember his power. Remember his might, whatever it is. To remember. We all, it's things that we know, but sometimes we need to purposely remember. The next one is to worship. Psalms 48 and 9 says, Oh God, we meditate on your unfailing love as we worship in your temple. Any kind of meditating on the word of God, it should always result in worship. Because as we begin to think about the things of God, there's a lot of reasons to magnify him. The last one there is to apply. Going back to Joshua 1 and 8, that you meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do. We talked about this with Bible study, but there's no point in reading the Bible, and there's no point of meditating on God's word if you're not planning to do anything about it. So there's the applying. So what might that look like in a practical sense in your life? Just going to throw some things out here for you to think about. Solitude. We notice a lot of times in the Psalms, David would talk about meditating on the Lord in his bed in the early hours of the morning, all these situations. We see Jesus would often go off by himself or with the small group of his disciples. There's, an important, it, there's an importance of rest. We even see the importance of rest in the scripture. We know God rested the seventh day. And it is a prince, and then, the, of course, the Sabbath principle. We should keep in mind that it's important to have times of rest because if we're always going, 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 are we having time to sit and rest in the Lord and meditate on his word? So just some things to think about, to just be still in his presence, to let him speak to us. Some people like to journal um, and just reflect on what they've read and what God's speaking to them about. Maybe discussing it with somebody else. Now, I know meditation's usually in here, but maybe it might help for you to just share what God's been talking to you about. That conversation, iron sharpens iron. Worship music. You don't think about worship music being a form of meditation, but when you get yourself a song, especially one that's based on the word of God, I hope you're picking songs that are based on the word of God, and you let that play and you begin to sing, what are you doing? You're meditating on the word of God. You're meditating on the word of God. Memorizing scripture. Power of repeating it. Getting it inside Casual prayer. By that, I don't mean casual as in taking it lightly. I mean, it might not be your designated prayer time, but you're waiting in the queue and, Lord, I just want to think on the things of God. You know, you're washing dishes, you know, and it's not your prayer time, but you still can have a conversation with the Lord. Some might have a verse of the day. I like to, when I read the Word of God, I read several chapters following the Bible plan, you know, so read it in a year. And it's often a lot of chapters. So I like to, at the end of it, just what really stood out to me? Is there one thing, one verse that I can take away and I can chew on this throughout the day that I can focus on? So however you choose to incorporate it, maybe that's just some ideas, but however you choose to incorporate meditation into your life, let me just encourage you to be aware of your thoughts. The way that you think has power, and we want to be thinking on the right thing thinking on the word of God. Med biblical meditation is not emptying the mind, as we have said, but it is directing it. Last verse is this, Isaiah 26 and 3. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. What a promise we have from God. Mm -hmm. We want that peace of God that passes all understanding, that perfect peace. And it is promised to those who will fix their minds on Jesus, who will think about the things of God, who will meditate on his word. There is peace that is promised. Sometimes we rob ourselves of the peace of God because we're meditating on the wrong things. Let's meditate on the word of God. Let's Amen. chew on the, on the right things, the word of God. Amen. Amen. If you missed any blanks, I'll help you fill them in after. But why don't we stand? right now. Let's just pray.
pray that the Lord would help us to apply this, that he would help us to meditate on his word. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word, and I thank you, Jesus, for the power and the revelation and the peace that is contained within it. Lord, I pray that you would help each and every one of us, Lord, as we fight in the spirit, God, as we war in the spirit, Lord, for the battle of our mind, Lord, Satan would love to have our minds. He would have, love to have the mind of our children and the minds, oh God, of this world controlled. But Lord, as your people, Lord, we are going to stand up and say, not in my mind. Lord, we want your word to rule. We want your word to be the center of our thoughts, oh God. Lord, I pray, God, every incorrect thinking, Lord, everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, Lord, I pray that it would brought, be brought into captivity, be brought into submission to your word, oh God. Let us have the mind of Christ within us, Lord. Let us think as you think, Lord. Help us, oh God. Help us, oh God, to be mindful, to be thoughtful on the things of God. Lord, to have your word hid in our hearts that we might not sin against you. Lord, we all, our goal, God, we want to be more like you, Jesus. We want to be more like you. Lord, I pray that you would help us to have discipline in our thought life. Lord, that we would be thinking on the things that you want us to be thinking of. And we give you all the praise and all the glory for being with us tonight, Lord. Thank you. Bless each one that is here, God. Protect them this week, God. Protect their minds. Protect them physically. And go with them. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. God bless each and every one of you. Till we come again.